Welcome everybody to Hustle Culture Live. And today we have an amazing guest. He goes by Keenan and he's going to talk about a lot of things from sales to hustling to just living the life that you want to live. And with me as always, I've got my co-host, my partner in this, Los Carlos Gill. Welcome yo, to the show. Yo, yo, welcome to Hustle Culture, all of you hustlers watching us out there on Blab. You're on with another episode with Tayo and I, and we've got in the seat with us today, Mr. Keenan, good mm -hmm. friend, really excited to have him here on the show. Let me tell you how amazing Keenan is. He's a CEO and founder of Sales Guy Inc. He's a keynote speaker. He's one of the top 50 sales and marketing influencers, and he's also the author of his upcoming book called Not Taught which he's gonna talk about with us here on the show today. So welcome to Hustle Culture, Keenan. Boom! Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'm excited about this. As I was telling you before we started recording, I'm so excited I did not go on the slopes today, or at least in the morning, so I could spend my time with you. And when it's a powder day, they have a saying up here, there are no friends on a powder day. So you all should be super <laughs> privileged because I found the time. All right. Well, I got to tell you, Keenan, I'm, I'm very, very honored that you would you would give us some of your time on Powder Day. Uh, you know, it's we feel tremendously honored and we'll make sure it's worth your while. And then we'll just give you amped up so you can go take care of those powders and run up the slopes. Yeah, I got love for you guys. It was my pleasure. All Thank right. you for having me. Hey, pleasure, pleasure. So what Carlos and I like to start off with is, is what we call the weekly grind. You know, I've seen your videos. I know that you always do it. You're always grinding throughout the week. I don't even think there's a weekend for you. It seems like you, you grind 24 seven, except for the brief time you want to go hit the slopes. But in our weekly grind, we cover what we did during the week, how we hustled, how we grinded, what we, our successes, our failures. So I'll, I'll kick us off here and then we'll go to you then Los. But uh, we do that before and then we dive into the interview. So the weekly grind for me was uh, I, I had a bunch of meetings. I, Carl should tell you I was pretty out of pocket this week. I was uh, in and out of meetings for an idea I had for my business. We're building a network of podcasts. And I was going in and out, sourcing out hosts and, and sourcing out content. And it was interesting because I had different meetings in different time zones. So I would wake up at 6 a.m. and r head right to a Skype call because I was talking to someone from England. Then I end my day in, in like Vietnamese time <laughs> while it's morning day. So I'll be going to bed 2 a.m. and wake up at 6. So it was a bunch of that, but it felt good. I think you can talk about this, Keenan, when you feel like you have an idea and you, you, you feel like you're on the cusp of something. So everyone that you're talking to is, is pushing you into the right direction. So even though it feels like you're not sleeping, you're not talking anywhere, you're on your way towards achieving something. So it was, it was straight hustling, but as long as I had my Red Bull here, as you can see, I think I was good. I think I was good, but it, it was mainly phone calls, reading, and um, I'm still on my one book a month in, so I, I'm halfway done, and I wake up every morning with Seth Godin, as you all know. So uh, yeah, that, that was it for me, Carlos. It was, it was Seth Godin. It was meetings all day, <laughs> and of course, <laughs> yesterday, Adele's album <laughs> dropped. <laughs> so you know, I, your boy had to listen to Adele's album, so it, it, it was good. Um, and uh, that, that was my weekly grab. What about yours? Um, you know, I, I, I think I put on a front. Like, I'm a spurt worker. So I work my ass off and then I don't work a lot much and I work my butt off. But every once in a while when you have that style, something comes where it's like a perfect storm. And three or four things all need to be done at the exact same time. And there's no room to move it around. Mm -hmm. And this Tuesday night was that. I had three things that had to be done by Wednesday morning. I had to get something for a client. I, I, written. I couldn't just make it up. So I had to write something out for a client. Then I had to read a 275-page book. So I was prepared for my um, for my uh, the word show with a really cool author. And then I had to do a presentation, a two-hour presentation. I had to do right after the word show. So my ass was up to like 2 30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I got two hours sleep, but I got it done. Boom! Got it done. You did. That's what. That's got how it you done. do it, man. 275 pages. <laughs> All right, yeah, you all know, right, so right. actually, Close. we don't have to go too far. I put some practice into work this week from a conversation I had with Keenan the week prior about reading books. And we get so caught up in the grind of our jobs, our businesses, social media, networking events. But I am extremely guilty of not taking enough time to read books. And knowing that we're going to have Keenan coming on the show, 
I actually was starting to read his book that's coming up called Not Taught. And I'm going to start putting this into motion on a weekly basis where I'm going to start reading a book every single week and really good advice that, that Keenan gave me. Uh, so I appreciate it, my man. And it was really around if you do more reading, your speaking, the finesse of how you convey yourself, how you communicate will improve. And I actually saw that come to light this week in meetings of mine and different business dealings. So thank you, my man. Oh. My pleasure, baby. Yeah, true. No, absolutely. And you know what? You know what I do? With the reading, uh, you know, you you know, Carlos, I've been doing this reading at least every month. I want to read one or two books at least. It it definitely does, especially when I had Ivan on. When you had Ivan on, I, I used to read Audible, but then when Ivan started going with the two X, three X, it's like you know, I'm, I'm gonna hack my way into three books. So so I've been doing that a lot, and I've been reading it at a faster speed. But it's it's actually helped me because I I'm in New York, take the subway about 45 minutes to work. And I get there, I'm halfway through a book, come back, you know, halfway through another book. So like you said, it, it adds to your knowledge and, have, uh, and it definitely makes you more aware of potential ways you can be great. And with that, I want to start off with a quote that says, don't be afraid to give up the good to go for the great. I like that. That's John D. Rockefeller. I think a lot of times, I think a lot of times we, we, uh, we feel complacent with our ways. We need to challenge ourselves and... Um, that's why we're glad we have you here, cool. Keenan. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be good. A challenge is what I do. I'm, you know, I'm the chief antagonizer. So let's roll. Let's antagonize. Let's, let's stir the pot. Let's roll. Let's roll. Let's roll. Okay. We start with number one. Why don't you just tell us? Tell us about your hustle. Tell us about the journey. Tell oh, us about dude. the story. That's a you want to know. Ah, you, you got to pick a place in time. You got, you got time. Ah, that's it. All right. All right. You got time. So. When I when I saw I knew I listened to your show a couple times and I heard the question and I was like okay I think I'll start here with my business and then on the drive up to Vail where I am now I was listening to your show again and I was listening to Anna and she started the story uh, about her family and so I, I said you know what she went a little deeper so where should I go with this and I think where I'm going to go with my story is my hustle started somewhere along the lines of high school when. I was a bum. Like I didn't care about high school. I didn't put time into anything. I just, I just wanted to have fun. And like Anna was talking, I didn't really see right. the value in learning a lot of the stuff I was learning. But this is where my hustle came in. I was aware enough, or I should put it another way, not stupid enough to make mistakes that were permanent that I couldn't turn back from. So I knew if I never really got good grades, I could fix that later. I knew if I didn't go to class one day, I could fix that later. I knew, you know, I knew I could fix stuff. So what I started learning was live the life for you. Just don't do something stupid that you can't unwind. Don't break the law. Don't, you know, don't, you know, have kids and do stupid stuff like that, right? Just make sure you leave a window open. And when you're ready, you will climb out that window. And that's what I did. I was ready right around the time I was 24. Three years old, I was driving. I'll never forget this one, man. I'll never forget. I was, I was bussing tables. Okay, I think I'm some cool, badass, good-looking dude up in Boulder, right. Colorado. Blah, blah, and I'm bussing tables. It's like the week of Christmas. Maybe it was like two nights before Christmas. It's snowing like crazy. There's nobody coming to this restaurant. Everybody's ordering matzo ball soup, and I got to deliver this shit. And I'm driving down the road at like 7:30 at night. Snow everywhere. None of my friends around. Right. And I'm right. doing this just because I need to pay my rent. And as I'm driving, I look to my left and there's the University of Colorado. And I'm like, OK, mm -hmm. this is it. I, yeah. I cannot live the rest of my life like that. And mm -hmm. from that day on, that day on, I went for everything I wanted and never looked back. Hmm. That's interesting. So you have you had several pivotal moments and I, I love the imagery that you paint. You know, you know, you live in a very picturesque city anyway, uh, in, in this town. But you it seems like you came to this crossroads where you're like, this can't be my life. You know, my moment was, you know, right after school, I I got the sales job, um, you know, after doing a few nonprofits and I felt like I was doing what I wanted to do. And then I got the sales job and I I remember I kept banging my head on the desk every morning. Like saying this can't be the next 60 years of my life. You know, I was just 21, 22. I was like fresh out of college and I thought, I got a job. People don't have a job. But it kept coming back to me. <laughs> like this can't be 
what life is for the next 60 years. And then I, I, it was that moment, you know, that was the beginning of many moments for me to, that I decided to shift. Now, can you expand on why that shift is very important to, to actually act on? Because many times people say, you know, I've thought of it, but I want to pay the bills. I want to pay for my school. I want to pay loans. I have, I have kids. I have married. You know, I'm doing this. I can't just leave and do all this stuff. It wouldn't make sense for me to just, quote unquote, hustle. Can you talk about why you still yeah. need to go, and go I, down I'm gonna that take, path? I'm going to go back to something you said that I think too many people gloss over, right? You said, you know, you had that pivotal moment and why people should act on it. Well, that's that's the point right there. It wasn't like I wasn't working. It wasn't like I wasn't, you know, making enough to pay my bills, barely, right? But what it, what it, that moment for yeah. me and your moment for you, as you described it, wasn't that you were going to start hustling. It was you were going to take ownership for the outcomes of your life. Mm-hmm. That's yep. the big crossroads, right? That's there. it. Most people do day to day just enough to get by. And it never stops for them to say, wait a minute. I want to go here, mm-hmm. not over there. And that's going to take action on my part. And I have to own that. And so I'm going to own it from this moment on. Yeah, that is, that's, that's real talking. Right. Yo, Kino, you know, we all have our pivotal moments in life. And, you know, Tayo shared his. For me, it was 25 years old. I'm thinking I'm at the top of my game, you know, in the corporate world. And then the economy hits and boom, I'm going to have a job. My wife is eight months pregnant. I don't have a college degree to fall back on. So I don't know what I'm going to do next. So I had to turn to social media and start networking to grow a business. And we all have these stories of having to pivot because as you know, life isn't a bed of roses and you can have these great dreams and goals and the plan, the roadmap to get you there, but you have to be willing to pivot. So talk to us about some of the obstacles that you faced along the way, because as we do this interview, we're going to talk a lot about the successes and what you're doing today. But the true value of hustle culture is getting to know about you and, and, and your hustle. What has helped get you along the way? And where are some of the obstacles that you've had to face? Wow. You know, I'm asked this question a lot. And I don't think I ever answer it really well because I don't know. I really don't know what it is about me that allows me to, to overcome the hurdles. And I'm not even sure what's a hurdle versus what was an opportunity. Right. I mean, at the moment, it may feel like an op- a hurdle. But then as you get out of it, you look back, like, that wasn't a hurdle at all. That was an opportunity. And thank God that happened or I wouldn't be where I am today. So <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to to minimize this, but I, I really struggle with it. Right. So I don't know. I don't know if it was my dad, who I'm not very close to. Um, he used to tell me all the time. He used to scream it at me. He'd be like, for Christ's sake. OK, you're responsible for yourself. Right. He would say, no one's coming. And that's your problem. You fix it. Mm-hmm. And he, he just kept pounding me in the face with this idea of personal accountability and responsibility. And, and so maybe that's it. Maybe it's also a little bit of nature. Right. It's just sort of my personality. When I was a little kid, if I wanted something, I, you know, I'd be lazy, lazy, lazy. And then all of a sudden I'd wake up. Oh, I want to do that. And boom. I'd go do it. Right. And I I just go at full bore. My oldest daughter is kind of like that. It drives me insane. She she watches videos and doesn't seem too active. And all of a sudden she finds she's interested in and boom, full force. I mean, she's she crushes it. So I, I don't know if I'm going to give you a good answer here. I, right. I just think you got to own your life. And from there, the story will take care of itself. Refusing to be a victim. That's it. Refusing you know, I, I don't think that's, that's, that's what I want to say. Refusing Refuse to be a victim. victim. Yep. There you go. Uh, certainly relate. There you go. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I think what, what you were saying, I know, I, know, I know from the comments says it's a killer point here. Perspective is everything. I think it's, it is really a matter of perspective. Like you said, you know, at the time you're going through something, it might seem like it's, it's the worst thing in the world. Like why you, but you know, the funny thing, it is not just you. If you look around, there are many people around that are going through hard times of their own. And if, if you, I think the mistake people make sometimes is thinking they're the only ones to do that. Uh, one of my biggest weakness is asking for help sometimes. And, I, you know, sometimes I found that not refusing to be the victim, like you said, changing the perspective, like Anna says, and also understanding that this is not me. It's part of life and how you push through. You know, it's always done for the darkest. I was listening to The Rock on Oprah's, uh, you know, a mastermind thing. And he said he had a depress a moment of depression, but he if he didn't, if he didn't push through, mm-hmm. he wouldn't be what he became today. He had to realize that he had to stand up for, for what he do what he was doing and just continue to work hard and understand that it will be better. You can't play that victim role and you have to understand that 
stay positive, don't whine, don't complain. And then whatever you want to achieve will come into your, your role. And th that segue into this next question is because you said you had that perspective when we asked you the first question, but then when did you know it was going to be the salesman? Because it's a difference when you have a perspective that you don't want to do something, but then you realize, you know, look, I'm Keenan. I'm the one man, one name person. I'm not going to go by my first name. People call me Keenan. That's what I'm going to be. And I'm going to be the salesman guy that makes an impact and builds a, a bunch of people and creates killer YouTube videos. When did you realize that you that know, was your You know, again, I, let me let me do it this way. Carlos asked a brilliant question on my hey, for my Hey Keenan show, right? Where people ask me questions on, on Twitter at the hashtag Hey Keenan, I answer them. Uh, you know, straight up borrowed the idea, stole the idea from Gary Vaynerchuk. I had done other one-on-one -on -one, um, question and answer privately for folks, and it wasn't scaling. And and I, and I was right. like, oh, that's a good idea. Let me make it public. Duh. So, but um, with that said, Carlos asked a question about what my definition of hustle is. And my definition of hustle is that there are four elements to it, right? It's hustle of the mind, hustle of the heart, hustle of the emotions, and physical hustle. And I answered it that way because too many people – think hustle, like everything else, is a quick fix, right? And the truth of the matter is there, are, there is nothing in my life, mm -hmm. no matter how successful, how good it went, that was a spot in time. Nothing. There was always a bunch of stuff that led up to it, and the journey culminated in that success. So with the sales guy, and me, going by Keenan, everybody calls him, most people call me by Keenan uh, because my Twitter handle or whatever. So that would just sort of fell into it by itself. But as far as the sales guy, I was running sales team like Carlos working for, mm -hmm. you know, the man. And I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was let go um, because of a, of a major corporate merger. And they let the entire sales team go. And I was vice president of sales. I've been crushing it. I'm like, no problem. I'll get another job in somewhere else because I'm killing it. I'm good. Well, it took me a year to find a job. And I, ha I had just having a baby. I just got married. I was building a house. I was like, this is torture. So I said, I got an idea. Rather than waiting for the next time I lose my job, why don't I start blogging? And if I can get 100, 200, maybe, oh, God, for even 1,000 followers, if I ever find myself looking for a job again, I can simply blog about it. And all these people have been reading about all the stuff I wrote and how good I am. They go, oh. Oh, I know someone, aren't you right? That was the thought. That was the thought. Two years later, people start writing to me saying, hey, I read this post. Can you help me with this? I run this company over here and I'm struggling with this problem. Can you help me with this? And so that's where the sales guy came from. And the only reason I'm called the sales guy now is that's what my blog was called. Mm -hmm. So it felt stupid to then change the name and brand. Right. So I was like, well, okay, now. And then sure as heck, three months after that, and this is the interesting about Hustle, mm -hmm. Right when I was getting divorced, I started mm. the company. A merger came in again, let the entire um, North American sales team go. So I'm out of a job. I'm getting divorced. I'm moving out. And I have a, I have a decision to make. Do I try to spend a year finding another job working for the man? Or do I bet on me and see if I can grow this consulting practice to something worthwhile? And we all know what I chose to do. I, I got to say, hmm. Keenan, I love you, man. Your fire, your swag, your energy is so damn contagious and inspiring. And for those out there that, that don't know how, how I got to know Keenan, just to provide some context out there. So when I went to go work for LinkedIn earlier this year in sales solutions, I was exposed to this world of social selling and got to know who some of the, the top thought leaders in the industry are of sales. And that's how I came to know of Keenan. And as soon as I saw your videos and what you were doing, here I see a guy that's rocking his Beats by Dre headphones, wearing the flannel shirts. He's I don't know flannel today. He, yeah, you don't have flannel today, but he's not the typical, when you think of a salesman, he's not the gray-haired, stuffy, older, stodgy, shirt and tie sales guy. So what I want to know, man, is speak to your uniqueness. How does your uniqueness help you be who you are and benefit you in business? I think we might have... Keenan? <laughs> that, that's a good steal image. That's a good steal image of Keenan. But Keenan is going to come back. I think he just needs to refresh his page. But 
I, I, I do. I do love Keenan uh, Carlos. And I think he's got a great, great way of bringing about energy. But the, the what do you think about his point on betting on yourself? Because you bet on yourself a few times and, you know, you've had several starting moments where you realized uh, Keenan's back, where you realized that you needed to bet on yourself and, quote unquote, leave the man for a little bit. Why did you, you know what, Kyle? Like for that me, I was I was forced back. into early retirement, so to speak, because I was working in the banking industry, and legitimately, there were no jobs in banking, so I, I had to branch out my own and find a way to hunt, if you will. And I was I was presented with an opportunity to go work back for the man, mm. and you know, knock on wood, you know, I've had a really good opportunity to work for some really cool different brands, and I look at everything that I do as paid education. So you got to look at it as that, you know, for me, what I do in my corporate roles, that's, that's a paid MBA. And I like to look at as the real MBA because what you learn out in the business world is completely different than what you learn in the classroom. And I'll say that as someone who spent half of an executive MBA at a university and had now the opportunity to, to educate, you know, make an educational comparison of what education is in corporate versus uh, what it is in the classroom. So Keenan, back to you though. What I was saying before is you look at, at, at yourself, right? You've got the Beats by Dre headphones on, the flannel shirts, the swagger. You're always on fire, always go. How does that help you stand out from the traditional, more stodgy, shirt and tie, gray haired sales trainer out there? Well, okay. So I don't know that it helps me or it hurts me. But what I think is more important, let me, let me step us back a little. What I think is more important, and this is critical, and I learned this early, so that's one of the reasons I recommended to you to reading and stuff like that, is it wasn't my beats. As a matter of fact, my blog and all that stuff, I didn't wear beats in the beginning. I didn't wear the, the, the plaid shirts every day back in the beginning. Right? right? That all came after. What really, I believe, differentiated me was my knowledge and how I chose to present it. It was my content. Right. I demonstrated and I didn't know this when I first started. Don't, don't think I wasn't scared shitless to think that maybe I, I, I know enough to give anybody any value. But I sat down and I sat with my blog and I looked at the problems people were facing. I looked what I struggled with. I knew what salespeople were dealing with. And I tried to come up with solutions and ideas and, and environments that help people accomplish this stuff. And I wanted to do it in a different way. I didn't want it to be a boring, a boring read. So it really started with me with the content. And, and I'm lucky enough that people like it. But. I knew my shit, I got better at it, and I provided valuable information that could help people. Then when my brand started to grow, it made sense to stick out. And also, it's my personality, right? Mm-hmm. I, I have a closet full of suits. I mean, Armani, right. Canali, um, Hugo Boss. I used to have my shirts custom made with my initials on. I mean, I, I had that look. Ballin'. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, no, did, did no. you have Tom Ford? <laughs> That's my Jay Z reference, but <laughs> you know, you know, you gotta have the top four. But um, okay, no, you know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like yes, you got better yes. at being yourself. That's that's really what it is. You got better at being yourself, and your authenticity shone through everything you were doing. And I think that's that's really important in whatever you do. You know, it could be you know, I'm someone on Saturdays on House of Culture. These are the only times I actually don't wear suits. But you know, I, I like to wear suits, and that's the type of thing I like to do. But other people, it might not come across as authentic. But it, the content, the delivery, the message, the goal is what has to remain authentic, no matter who you're reaching out to. So, I really appreciate you you bringing bringing out that. I want to go back to something you said earlier. This is something I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs and hustlers feel like um, they can't do, or they, they you know they can't do. So, you said you took something from Gary Vaynerchuk, and I'm a big proponent of taking. <laughs> and and learn, taking things and making it your own and doing those type of things. So you took that, you know, ask, you know, ask Gary and people would be like, wait, why are you copying Keenan? Come on, be original. And and I, I just went and said you're original. But can you tell me why that's a very bad mentality to have where you feel like you can't take something and make it your own or even expand on it and not do that? Because I'm a big proponent. I mean, I'm doing a network of podcasts. I mean, people have done a network of podcasts, but what's different about me is what I, I feel like my message is going to be. So Good why look. do you think it's important to, be able to take one from thing the greats? Short, okay, there's no original content. There's nothing original. Okay, Gary Vayner did not invent the ask question. It's Gary Audi with his style. But other people are doing this already, yes. asking 
Ask me this. Ask fucking what's what's that lady's name on the on the uh, ask uh, that columnist lady that used to be in the newspaper. If anybody remembers those, ask Annie or what the hell was that lady's name? But yes, yes, this is nothing oh, new. Yeah. People, get yeah, over yeah. yourself for yeah. Christ's sake. <laughs> God, you know. And then it's a journey. And then it's a journey, right? So this is the other part. Exactly. I'd rather you copy every fucking person in the world and get good at it, and then one day you'd be like, hey, wait a minute. I know how to do this, and I've got an idea. And then you might create something semi-original. But if you sit in your seat, wait until you come up with the next freaking light bulb, enjoy it, okay? While the rest of the world is flying down the road. Get over yourself. Do something. Wow. <laughs> that was bad. Yo, this is the guy is insane, man. I love it. I love it. This is, this is Red Bull. That's our guest, Keenan. But but it's so it's so true. And you know, my, my thing is hashtag real talk. And you just dropped it, my man. But so many of us out there, and when I say us, I'm saying just very broadly in the business and the social media community, we're always looking at what the next guy's doing, but we're not looking at what we can be doing to make a difference. And what I love about my co-host here, Tayo, is you know, his thing is use your difference to make a difference. And you like just that. spoke about that, Keenan. So you take that's Something that's been done for generations, which is providing thought leadership at the highest level through YouTube, through Hey Keenan, and you're using what makes you different to stand out. Because if it wasn't for you doing that, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today because you would have looked to me just like another guy who's talking about social selling. Pretty much. I mean, I'll just say, I don't think we need to kill that. Just get off right? your ass no, and go do absolutely. something. It's part of the journey, yeah. right? I mean, move, just move. Journey, journey by definition means you're going from one spot to another spot. What journey are you on? Is it being, are you in a cart and is your ass being pushed down the road? Or are you actually making the cart go where you want it to go? I don't know what to say. I mean, that's simple. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is so high energy. I Yo, let's, let's keep the, let's high, let's keep the high energy going. So, uh, yeah, a sales guy. A sales salesman Inc., right? Your company. You, that, that's, that's your company. And you've got, yeah, sales guy, sales guy, and sorry about that. And you've got, uh, you know, this new book called Not Taught. Can you talk about both and educate the audience on what your business is about and why this book okay, so, is really something that we all so really a sales guy should is get simply, behind? It's a consulting business and a recruiting business. So uh, the consulting side, actually, I don't do training. I actually literally consult. I work with CEOs or chief revenue officers, and when their revenue isn't where they want it to be, I help them fix it. So, or if they want to grow, whatever. So I, I address it from the truly strategic operational process side. I don't do much quote unquote training. Um, and then I have a recruiting business as well, where we go and find salespeople for sales organizations and we recruit there. Um, the not taught book, what I'm really excited about here is it's, it's sort of what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because I just told my story, I won't go into it again, but I woke up one day and realized that the world has changed. And I was asked to give a presentation to, I will, I'll go a little longer on this one because it's important. I was asked to give a presentation to some uh, graduate students who were about to, to graduate. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a commencement speech, it was just a class. And so I said, what do you want me to say to him? He said, well, what would you tell them coming into the workforce? So I sat down, I thought about it for a while, and I came up with this list of like 10 things or 12 things, right? And I gave it to the class, and as the class was over, they really liked it, and, and then I blogged about it. This was like three years ago. And I looked at the list, I said, you know what? Half, if not more, more than half this country needs this. They don't get it. And then I said, well, I wonder why they don't get it. What's the problem? And then it struck me. We have moved from the industrial age to the information age. That transition has ushered in a whole new approach, set of tools, and set of opportunities that didn't exist before that changed the rules in how we position ourselves for success. And most of that is driven by the ubiquity of information. And so not talk is so not taught is, right. is, is that idea that too many people are still acting as if they're in the industrial age, trying to move their careers ahead and trying to be successful, unaware that the game has changed right underneath their feet, but nobody's teaching them. People like you guys have figured it out on your own and you're running forward, but there's a whole world behind us that has no clue what's going on, none. And no one's teaching them. They're teaching it in school. There are still people out there who are trying to ingrain them in the old way, tell them to go to get their education, telling them to work on their resume. And this shit doesn't work. So it's like, you know what? I'm going to teach the world that this shit's changing. And maybe some people can capitalize on these opportunities. 
Love it, love it. So, so Keenan, so Chris Brogan oh, says love it. that not taught is Red Bull for the brain. And I love it. I love that. I yes. love it too. So with that being said, you know, you talked about your inspiration for the book, right? It's teaching this new generation that the old school principles, you got to throw them out. Even though I will say, I do believe with things like relationship building, specifically old school rules still apply with new school technology because things like yeah. social media, what we're doing here, you have to use social media as the bridge to break the ice, but social media doesn't necessarily replace face-to-face -face contact. But with that being said, I agree with you that you got to throw out what worked in, in the old school and you have to adapt and evolve. So with that being said, what can readers of Not Taught expect from your book? What can they expect to walk away from learning? Oof. Um, that first, they have to have a presence. This whole, I'm private, I don't want to share my stuff, I don't care what someone had for lunch, this, this idea that I need to be private has got to go out the window. You, ha you have to stop hiding, right? This idea that if you have a network of friends that constitutes no more than the people you went to high school with, the people that live down the street from you and the people that you go to work with is going to suffice, that's bullshit. Because find out what, just like Carlos went through, find out how good those people are going to be when we go through another uh, downfall and your total network of people that know you and value you is 20 people, 30 at the best, you're screwed, right? So you have to grab onto this idea that I need to create reach and I have a whole chapter dedicated to reach. You have to build an identity, a brand, right? This idea that my brand is 15 years experience at Oracle and you know making quarter and president's club year over year is a brand that's going to get you a job. That's not going to cut it in the 21st century because you know what? There with social media and LinkedIn, there are hundreds of people mm. like you who've made quarter and made president's club and been working for a company for 20 years. No one gives a shit, right? You got to bring more to the table than that. And so I talk about yeah. that and all kinds of other little things mm -hmm. in this book that drive out what has changed and what you're going to need to do and focus on if you want to make it in the 20 and to be successful, not just to pass by. Anybody can pass by. Well, let's stay on that. Let's, let's talk about being successful. And let's also talk about the, the things that are not taught today. In your opinion, from your perspective, what are the top three things that are not being talked about okay. that people Number need to one, do in order to be successful in order, today? But one of my favorite is experience versus expertise. Mm -hmm. Too many people think they're great because they got experience, okay. right? Oh, well, I said, well, why should I hire you? I've got 25 years experience. I sit there and look at it. What the fuck does that mean? Really? Seriously? 25 years experience? Really? What does that mean, please? <laughs> because if you just sat in a seat for 25 years checking boxes, I don't know that you know anything, right? So and I had one of the greatest, I, I took this from a boy on my show, um, a Dunning, David Dunning of the Dunning Kruger effect. If right. you don't know the Dunning Kruger effect, go check it out. I talk about it in my book. He was on my show. And I had been searching for a nugget to, to argue this point. He gave it to me. So I always have to give him credit. There are people, everybody listen to me very carefully. There are those of you who have 25 years experience and three or four years of expertise. Mm -hmm. And there are those of you with five or six years of experience with 10 or 15 years expertise. I don't want your experience. I want your expertise. And you had better be able to demonstrate. That's rule number wow. one. In the industrial age, mm. it was too mm. difficult to prove it. I didn't have blogs. I couldn't write a book. I couldn't do a YouTube video. There was no distribution platform for me to demonstrate my expertise to you. So I had to default to experience. Mm -hmm. That's not the case anymore. Not the case. So that's the first one. Expertise trumps experience. The second one. Okay. It's 13 chapters. I want to pick the ones I think are the most. The second one is brand new. Okay, guys, listen. You have to understand your value. Whether you like it or not, you're a product. When somebody is making a decision to invest in your company, to invest in you, and that's what they're doing. When they hire you for a job or give you a promotion, that's an investment. Mm -hmm. And in their head, they're yep. processing, what do I get in return for this investment? So when they don't know you, or even when they do know you, you need to be spending as much time as possible developing a brand that focuses on delivering for your target audience. So if you're an accountant, what kind of accountant are you? Don't tell me your accountant with 25 years experience. Tell me your accountant who has a very unique approach 
to saving, uh, minimizing your tax liability. Tell me you're an accountant who has an amazing knack at getting out your quarterly reports in one third of the time. I don't know, I'm not an accountant, but I better be able to tell the difference between account A, accountant B, and accountant C besides 25 years experience and a gap degree or certification of gap, right? So you gotta build your brand, you right. have to, and you have to work on it and think, 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 why am I a great salesperson? Why am I a great social media um, expert? Why am I a great accountant? Why am I a great baby babysitter? What makes me, to your point, Tail, what makes me different and why in terms of value? Guys, listen to me there carefully. In terms of value to the people you do the work for. So that's your brand. And I think the third one is reach. In this world today, you have to have reach. You have to be able to get out there and touch people. You have to be able to influence more than a few people in your network, in your neighborhood, or at your school board. You have to be able to deliver reach. No, I, I love, I, I think those are, those are spot on. I love number two love around companies hire you, whether it's your business as a consultant, freelancer, whether you're an employee, companies hire you for the, the skill set that you bring. But just showing up to work, just getting a paycheck, that's being average. And I'm sure you guys can, can agree and relate to this. Being average isn't going to cut it. Being average is not going to be what sets you apart. You got to be great. You got to strive for greatness. And you got to be willing to work that much harder and grind that much harder than the next guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like I said it earlier. Don't be afraid to give up the good to go for the great. And that's John D. Rockefeller again. But uh, we've got yeah, so we actually have a question here for you, Keenan, from Mike Baltus. Mike is asking, out of the four leadership behaviors, directive, supportive, participative, or achievement-oriented, which one resonates more with some of the thought paradigms in the new book? That's a great question. And I don't address leadership too much in the book. But if I were to put a leadership overlay, I would say it's supportive and participative. I, I believe that we, we and, I've, and I've preached this to my clients, I believe that if you get ownership and engagement from your employees or the people that you're working with and they buy into their goals and they buy in or feel they own it. Remember I talked earlier, but we have to own our own lives. You can't be successful if you don't get ownership. So I believe that the job as leadership is to provide all the support people need to allow them to participate. Right. And I think the other two will come from themselves. If I'm in a position where I have to be directive, I failed somewhere. That's really all there is to it. Now, it doesn't mean that when you're in a position where you need to be directive, it's a complete failure. People get off the tracks, they go off the rails or the leader didn't do a good job with the vision and you have to turn quickly and you got to do things. That it requires directive. But I see directive as a as a tool, as a reactionary tool, not as a strategy. If you set good vision and you get buy in and you get people participating, you don't you don't need to be directive and achievement comes achievement oriented comes with setting the goal. So that comes with participation. So I like the middle two. Hope that answers this question. Well, gotcha. Gotcha. You know, um, you know, listening to you, this question keeps coming to my mind. I, th I keep thinking high energy. He can really spark up a room and light up a room. And, I, and I'm this, I'm just curious, what is the most creative thing you've done to get the attention of <laughs> someone you want to get the attention of? <laughs> I mean, I, I can just imagine there's so many stories that you have there. And I'm thinking, Keenan probably just, I don't know, maybe camped out in one day in someone's place. It was like, hey, Mr. Sir, how are you doing? Here's your coffee. Here's the thing. You go. And this I got is a great <laughs> I was just wondering. And I do have a couple. Oh, and kind of it? Ah, there's two I'm struggling to go between how I got my first big job. Okay, I'm going to go with the more fun one because I have two. But um, when I was in college, after that epiphany, that moment, I started going to University of Colorado. And I had learned there was something called semester at sea, where you got on a boat and you traveled, you literally circumnavigated mm. the world for like a hundred days. You went to 10 or 11 countries. In my case, it was going to be like Germany. I mean, sorry, it was going to be like Russia, China, Greece, Malaysia, India, Turkey, Morocco. And I was like, oh my God. And this was like at the time, this is in 1993, a long time ago. It's a whole different story. Um, it was... Twelve to thirteen thousand dollars for that semester. <laughs> I didn't have that money. I, I was on financial aid, and I didn't have that kind of money. But I heard through this girl I was dating. So, oh, they have a scholarship, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm in. 
And then I went and I went, I ran down to the office and I went to the semester C office and I pulled up the, the, the application and it said the requirements. And one of them was a 3.0 GPA. Hmm. I had a two, I had a 2.8. Right. And I was like, to hell, to hell, oh. if I'm going to say no to me, you're going to say no to me, but I am not opting out of this. <laughs> I get to see the great wall of fucking China. I'm going on this boat. So I, so I said to myself, I said, all right, how do I do this? How do I overcome a 2.8? So I decided to, and remember, this is before the days of Photoshop and the internet and everything. I decided to make a mock newspaper uh-huh. article as if somebody was interviewing me. So I, 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 on Word, I created these columns and then I said, you know, see you student trades classrooms for cabins. Jim Keenan headed around the world on semester at sea. And then the, then, the, then the question, when asked what this means to him, he says, and the reporter, the fake reporter, just asked the questions that was in the, in the, um, the uh, what do you call that thing that they wanted me to do? The, the, they wanted me to write something. Why can't I talk? When you write a story, not a story, when, when you, when you, when you go to college, what do they ask? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our audience. Essay. 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 Yes. Yes. <laughs> You get, you got Thank three you people on the side telling you this essay. Yeah, you got you. Carla. So for the essay, I asked the essay questions as if a reporter wrote them. Then I printed it out, cut it out, put it on, on paper, photocopied it, and then photocopied it to look like it came on real newspaper. And then I put a picture of the boat. And I submitted that as my essay. Right? So of course it got me an interview, even though I only had the 2.8. And I'll never forget this. I'm sitting across this table of all these interviewers at the university and they'll look at me and they go, we, we have to start this, this interview with one question. We're all really confused. Why do you need our help if you're already going? And I'm like, people, that's my essay. I'm not going. That wasn't really in the paper. And they're like, oh my God. <laughs> so I crushed the interview and it was supposed to be two half scholarships. They gave them both to me because I said, if I got a half, it wasn't wow. going to make a difference. That is an amazing I went around the world. story of using your difference yeah. to make a difference. Yeah. Let's 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 slow clap. Let's let's that for a second. That is. I, I think <laughs> no, you know I, the same holds true not only when you're in college, but when you're in the in the corporate sector too, or yeah, at any stage of your life, you have to find ways to stand out and get on people's radar because again, being average just doesn't cut it. So, so Tayo, let's roll with this for a second. I'm really curious to know from you, wh- what was the time? Do you have a Keenan type story of a semester at Steve? What have you done to, to kind of stand out in your, in your journey? Oh, well, yeah, I shared this in the first episode. It was, it was earlier this year. So I, I got my uh, MBA. So when you, when you all were talking about the MBA and all that, I was like, yeah, I completely understand what you're saying. So I uh, started off the new year in debt. You know, twenty thousand dollars in debt. That's pretty much like what people always say. And I was, I had just launched UID Media, and I was thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know if I'm going to graduate. It's my last semester. I've got to figure out a way to pay. Um, and then I had this moment where, I, I while I was thinking, I wanted, you know, gummy bears. That's like my weakness. Uh, you know, I am the African Superman, but my kryptonite is is gummy bears. But uh, so I went to get gummy bears, and then. I, when I went there, the the guy, uh, the the lady at the the counter just um, told me, "Hey, uh, sir, your your card doesn't work." And I was like, "Yeah, I'll try it again." She goes, "You, no, it doesn't work." And I was like, "No, I just checked it out the other day. It works." I looked at my, uh, I went to the ATM, overdraft twenty dollars, bam. It's like yeah, I just put my hoodie back on because it was cold. Walked back to the to the, to my room and just. And in shame and said, you know what? I'm at the point where I can't even get a gummy bear and I need to figure out how to pay for my school fees. I'm going, I'm going to figure out how to pay for it. So I went to school the next day, school I didn't start, but I went to the administrator's office. And I said, look, I'm still secure on campus. I, I helped launch the first career week and I've, I've helped bring more awareness to Fordham. That's where I went to school at. Um, I'm going to tell you why you're going to uh, wave off my $20,000 fee to have to pay the semester. <laughs> so I said, first of all, First of all, I need a $5,000 scholarship. <laughs> and then I'm going to convince you why I need to work for the remaining $15,000. So I put together this mini proposal and told them the ways I could do the different work study. It took about two, three days. And I'm like, okay, fine, fine. We can maybe get you the scholarship, but the remaining 15000 is going to be tough. So I just went back every day, was the first one in there. And then 
it just so happened that the the other work study I needed to showed up at a time when someone didn't show up. So this lady comes up and says, hey, so we need to give this work study to someone. And the person that was supposed to come is like 15 minutes, uh, 30 minutes late. And I'm like, I'm here. I've been here for the last five days. I'm the one you need. And it's just like, <laughs> OK, we'll give it to you. Sign up. And then the day before school started, the deadline of the payment, I had everything paid for. And then I was like, thank you, God. Because, but it, it all started was because I was like, I needed to find a way to get there. So I had all the meetings with all the deans and everyone, but it just came out at the moment of desperation. And I decided, you know, not me not being able to buy something was not going to, you know, put me down, but I was going to figure out a way to pay and, and graduate my friend. So I, I did graduated and, and I, money. you know, I, I'm not in debt anymore, but that was, that was the, yeah, that was the pivotal moment. And I, I was able to say, you know, I, I, I didn't have to pay $20,000 or I had to be owing an IRS or anything. So, you know, that, that was my creative moment. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? Not I, only, you had to hustle, man. Not only is that <laughs> using your difference to make a difference. I know you like that, tile, But that is also, that is also, hey, I I'm, I'm going to bring this full circle. That's also a lesson that's not taught, okay, in college. That is hustle. That is true hustle. And, and that's, I want to kind of bring it back to, to the book. And Keen, I know you, you were going to jump in. But I want to bring it back to, to the book because when I think of not taught and the lessons that Keenan is looking for others to walk away with, to me, I think hustle. I think grind. I think school of hard knocks. And it's taking what has previously been shown to you. You have to do things this way and really going outside the box and just breaking the box and really leveraging what you have in here and in here. Keenan. Yes, but yes, absolutely right. But what I wanted to do, and I didn't set out to make this like a, 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 a way to hustle, but hustle, in my opinion, is environmental, right? And so what I want to do is give people more. You can't just say to someone, go hustle, right? Because as I said in my, hey, Keenan, to you, I could be doing a lot of stuff that doesn't work, right? So I wanted to really take it to the next layer and give people real tangible shit to get their arms around, right? Mm -hmm. So what Teo described is what I attribute to my chapter called Think. Think, people. Look, today we are yeah. robots, mm -hmm. and we and we and, and schooling has like conditioned us not to think. So, if you really think of when we're talking here, we're talking about this hustle and that hustle. We say he was creative, etc. All of it's true, but the, it's those are symptoms. What really happened? What really went on is Teo, and he kind of said it. I was sitting here thinking, "How do I?" And when you start asking those questions, you start coming up with alternative options you begin to solve problems in a more innovative complex um, way to get you where you want to go so yes it was his hustle but it wasn't his hustle it was hustle stopping to say i would need to think but it was his commitment to thinking to solve the problem that scored him that and i talk about that in this book everything can be solved if we stop and think about it for a minute and just stop going on autopilot <laughs> yeah 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 it, it's a it's there's it has to be intention and action right you you have to have that mindset but you also have to be able to follow through and be willing to do that like you said there's so many preconditioned robots i mean i can't i can't tell you how many conversations you have with people where they say oh you know i did this i did this i put in the work and now i'm i'm this is what i want to yes. do and it's almost like they've settled and and they've accepted the fact that they've settled because that's almost a state of mind and it, i think people think too many times of um happiness as a, you know, as, as a destination and not a mood. It's like, they're always working towards, I'm just going to get to this. And then once I've reached here, that's my happiness quarter. But then it just like a mood, you can be happy. You can be sad. Happiness can come and go and you can even get happier. You can choose to be, to elevate your level of happiness. If you strive to just kill it, be excellent, knock it out of the park. And, and just understand no matter whatever level you reach at the top, there's always another another place people say the sky's limit i always like to say yeah no, the sky is my stepping stone yes. because i i, I reached the sky but look man well, <laughs> there's still more there's also, still more to, there's still more than i can achieve and then there you you're not gonna set what my mediocrity is so you know this is where i also say hashtag real talk hashtag and then we bring it back to snapchat because that's what we do but <laughs> yeah, <I have laughs> but uh I have, <laughs> yeah, I have there you go hashtag what's up but i i called happiness right and how you have to be happy mm -hmm. that's one of the lessons we're not being taught but you'll yeah. love the story in there i found a study that
It looks like uh, Keenan might have cut out for a second. No, I, I, I agree with you, Tayo. And I, I say, that I just put shows. it here in the comments. Happiness is really a state of mind. And, you know, yeah, and that's it. And yep. your mind is just a, such a powerful tool and asset. And what I keep in the context all the time is that everyone's grind. Everyone's hustle is unique. Okay, so look at everything that we do as Stepping Stones for the Future. Look at people that come in our paths Okay, as people that we can help elevate because no one's one grind or hustle is is all in the same. And again, to to Keenan's earlier points, we got so many robots, so many people looking at what this guy's doing, what that guy's doing. Be yourself, be you. And again, Ty, I hate to I hate to rip it off of you, man, but use your difference to make a difference. All right. Yeah. So are you oh, am I back? Am I You're back? back? No, it's different. We're good, we're good. Okay, so in, no, no, in, go back. in my back, chapter back, back, on back. happiness in the book, I found a study by Martin Seligman. And that study shows that actually happiness breeds success. Success does not breed happiness. And it's a powerful study that show, he, he has yes. this, what he calls this optimism test. And he found that these super optimists, these people who looked at the world as a place that they could get stuff done and they were very happy with where they were and, and, and all that stuff, outperformed people who had overscored or outscored them on a proficiency test. So it's a powerful Martin Seligman. Look him up. Happiness breeds success. Success, success does not breed happiness. Yeah, no, I, I you know, I always we're talking yes. about happiness here. One of my favorite movies is Pursuit of Happiness. One of my favorite quotes is, "Don't ever let someone tell you you can't do something." Not even me. All right, and and um, but you've been talking about several chapters in your book. You know, you've got this amazing, amazing energy, and and I can already tell it's going to be something that a lot of people can benefit from. So. Where can we find the book? Where can we buy it? Yeah. Where can we see it? Where can we, you can go to not, you, know, you can go to not and, uh, um, and you can pre-order it and I'll let people know when it comes out. It should be out. You know, I hate to say it's where I'm not good at details, but it's going to be out in the first week of December. I'm 99.9%. .9 something comes out of left field, knocks me over. It'll be out in, like right after Thanksgiving, first week of, of December. Not taught.com. Yeah. All right. So that definitely. Pre-order the book, y'all. Uh, check it out, and it's it's a great. You know, people are doing right, Christmas right. shopping now, so it's a great one to 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 ring in the yes. new year. Yes. <laughs> um, for sure. Job. You know what happened um, on ABC, Carlos? Every I think it's nine or ten. I, I watch it every every day, every Friday. It's got Mark Cuban, and it's got uh, a bunch of all these. It's called Dark Tank. Dark Tank. What's it called, Carlos? Oh, sorry. Okay, okay. So now it's called Truck Tank because, Keenan, we want you to give us a 30 second Truck Tank pitch about you and your business. Well, good. The world, Go. the world has changed, right? <laughs> the world has changed. What you were taught when you were a child, unless you're about 12 years old, we were all taught the old school stuff. Get an education. No, go to college, get as mm -hmm. much experience as possible. Don't rock the boat. Don't change too fast. Play it safe. You know, be private. All that stuff is gone. No one cares about your resume anymore. No one cares how much experience you have. Nobody cares about how much time you put in. One of my chapters is time versus results. People don't care anymore. They only care about what you can deliver for them. And because of this change from the information age to the, I'm sorry, from the industrial age to the information age, all the rules have changed, but that's created opportunity. And this book is designed to show you where those opportunities are and how you can capitalize on them. Boom. Bang. Boom. So how you can use your difference to make a difference. Yeah. No, so not my, not my, um, not, not, not taught, 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 right? com. Not taught, the com. book is called, w the w book is called not taught. Not For taught. Those watching this here on blab. I dropped a link on the comments. If you're listening to us on iTunes, the link is going to be in the description. So make sure that you check it out, grab your copy. You won't regret it. So Keenan, before we wrap up, where can those listening to you or watching you right now connect with you, find you, where can they keep up? Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at, at Keenan. You can find me on LinkedIn under Keenan as well, uh, because they make you put in a first name and last name. I have a dot. I think for my last name, because I had to fill in the box. Um, you can find me at a sales guy. <laughs> uh, and so if you, if you uh, what's the word, Google search a sales guy and or Jim Keenan, my whole name, you will find everything you need to find about me and maybe even stuff I didn't want you to find. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. 
All right. All right. Um, um, as we, uh, we would love to keep you on for five minutes or to 10 minutes after the segment, because I, I imagine we've got a lot of questions, but we have to dive into the next segment, which is called Hustler Spotlight. This is where Carlos and I, and maybe even you, Kenan, if you want to spotlight and highlight someone who's doing an amazing thing or who's just on his or grind and killing it for the week. Uh, mine is uh, is Anna Hendricks uh, today. She's a she was last week's guest, funny enough, but she was out there with, with MobCon um, and, uh, you know, I was following her progress from afar. And, you know, she she put together seems like they, they had a lot of a lot of good things going on. I saw her with Sean in the picture. I saw her doing some some amazing things out there. But, you know, she's someone who was an example of um, uh, someone that breaks the glass, uh, the glass ceiling, but also not afraid to, to be herself in, in business. So I think. I think um, that's a good example of someone who is who should be spotlighting someone who is who is who is not afraid to admit mistakes, but also not afraid to move forward and learn from them and just be herself. So that's that's my that's my hustler's uh, spotlight. Anna Hendrix, and she is at Anna Hendrix. She is related to Jimi Hendrix. She plays she plays guitar and, and does all that kind of stuff. I'm just kidding, but she's A A H N A Hendrix, and then you can follow her. Tayo, you know, I, right. I wish I would have gone first because I actually I had two and Anna was going to be one of the two. So, <laughs> Anna's amazing. If you haven't heard last week's episode, make sure that you go onto iTunes or Blog Talk Radio, download the episode, check it out. You know, to echo Tayo's point, not only did Anna have an amazing story to share with us here on Hustle Culture last week, but she owns her own digital agency, uh, Arch digital she was in minneapolis for mobcon just a great human being let's put business aside let's talk about the the person behind the avatar that you see on social media she's just a great person she's become a really just close personal friend and anna i know you're watching this right now so keep doing you keep hustling and uh, it's gonna be a great 2016 and and the other hustler out there is also watching this right now her name is monique aka q the brand it is her Twitter handle. She has a show on Blab called Marketing Therapy. Make sure that you give her give her a shout, whether it's on Twitter, watch her show on Blab. And she's also been a guest of ours here on Hustle Culture, so you can check out her episode. Again, another up-and-coming rising star in, in the world of social and digital and just a great person, a great human being. And that's what I look for is you know we talk so much about the business personas and what they're doing but i like to really get to know the people and um you know q is definitely someone that's uh you know won me over uh by getting to know her so thanks for uh for joining us q with that keenan we're going to turn it over to you my man do you have a hustler yeah. that you want to spotlight i do i do i i, I want to give props to kiki at wound tank bunny look she is my admin and my head of marketing and I am a tough guy to work for. I don't tell people what to do. I don't beat them with a stick, but boy, I got super, super high expectations. So if you can't live up to expectations, if you're not striving to get better, you'll last about two and a half seconds in my organization. And I am pushing Kiki so hard to get better, I'm pushing her so hard to elevate her game. And I can feel the stress it creates her, but just when I think she's about to break, boom, she pops up and gets to another level. So I want to let her know that she is my hustler of the week. I recognize what you're doing. I'm recognizing your growth. I can't thank you enough for the effort you put in. And know that I love you and I'm pushing you. I know it, but you're rising to the, to the effort every single time. You got so much more to achieve and I want to help you get there. I want to say I'm a big fan of right. Kiki right. as no, well, aka me. at Wu-Tang Bunny. <laughs> 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 I don't know why well, I keep thinking about that clan. I'm just thinking, I'm thinking of, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking so many songs I shouldn't be singing right now. But yes, Wu Tang Clan. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, you know, I, I love this episode, Keenan. And you know, I, I I started off the episode saying I've got to find my way to energize myself because I've been up all week. And then once you came on, I was like, why did I even buy a Red Bull? I mean, I already got the red, human Red Bull here. So it's been great. But a lot of the core of what this episode has been, it's been about challenging yourself, striving uh, past mediocrity, uh, daring to be great, understanding that, you know, you have that within you, but also taking action on all your intentions and surrounding um, yourself with, with good people. I think 
uh, I, I forget who says this, but your network is your, mm -hmm. uh, your net, your net worth. Um, you know, it's not, and that is really how you, you grow, you capitalize. So as, as we wrap up this episode, I just want to leave us and everyone with this word. Like I always say, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what you want to achieve, use your difference to make a difference. Keenan, we want to thank you so much <laughs> for being a guest on Hustle Culture today. You definitely brought the fire, my man. So thank you so much. And again, the book is not taught. You can go to nottaught.com. Make sure that you order a copy. And uh, Keenan, once again, my man, thank you for your support. And you know, we got your back all day, every day. Thanks, baby. You guys rocked. It was awesome. Peace.